It's dawn at Philadelphia's International Airport. During this day, 20,000 people will pass through this terminal building, arriving from or departing to places throughout the country and the world. Speeding along at 600 miles per hour, six miles into the atmosphere where the temperature is 50 degrees below zero, is now routine. Progress and technology have so transformed our lives that the inconceivable is now the status quo, and science fiction is the present, not the future. But one failure, one crash, forces us to ask ourselves if technological progress has not taken us beyond our human capabilities to cope with it. I mean, what they're making now is a, a termination of what did happen. It's going to be several days before they'll probably make any releases, and uh, well, investigations of this type could uh, run as much as six months before you come up with a conclusion. Uh, it departed from runway nine. Somewhere in the takeoff process, something occurred, and the uh, airplane came to rest at this point. Beyond that, anything would be speculation. There's 55 people on board and six crew. The FAA was initially on the scene. When the safety board arrived, they took complete control. A fractured ankle was the worst that I've heard so far. Well, this is the first uh, air carrier accident that we've had since 1951, uh, which I think is an uh, excellent record of safety as far as the airport is concerned. Philadelphia International Airport is one of our greatest symbols of prosperity. But our complacency in understanding this prosperity could, in turn, become our greatest threat. This building, only 20 years ago, represented one of the most modern airport terminals in the world. Today, it stands as a reminder of the continuing impact of aviation progress in Philadelphia. One hundred yards away, Philadelphia International Airport is still trying to cope with the same problems of growth and change that its predecessor could not withstand. The challenge and responsibility of keeping pace with the jet age falls upon the shoulders of airport director Bill Burns. When I first came to Philadelphia International Airport, it was probably in 1947, we had a small terminal building on Island Avenue, the separate restaurant building, a capacity for uh, about one one twentieth of the ticketing facilities that we eventually inherited in what was in 1953 the most modern airport terminal in the world. Things too fast, really. No, everything's moving too fast, too noisy. Uh, it doesn't impress me at all. <laughs> when I first came here in 1963, uh, the people were dressed like they were really going somewhere very important. They seemed to dress conservative. But today, done. and things are being done right, in my opinion. The program at Philadelphia International Airport is almost phenomenal. I think it's the largest single public works project ever undertaken by the city of Philadelphia as a single project. We're expanding the airfield capacity by building a new 10,500 foot long runway. We are expanding, or as a matter of fact, have expanded the present passenger terminal uh, from, let's say, 20 gates to 40 gates. Uh, at the same time, building 200,000 square feet of rentable space for 
departure lounges uh, with loading bridges connecting right to the door of the airplane so that people no longer walk across the rain-swept, wind-swept aprons. People are a little afraid about flying, even the ones who have been flying. And they get more irritated when things aren't convenient for them. When they have to go out into the, into the elements, it makes them a little more insecure. The way I feel about it, if you ever get it done, it'll be a happier environment, let's put it that way. Uh, right now it's about, I understand from talking to people, about a year and a half behind schedule. The people have to put up the money, and uh, whoever's putting up the money in the past has not had the vision to see what their real needs were going to be. In other words, you build what you can afford to build. In some cases, maybe not as much as you could afford if you wanted to. But it always seems to be something that built that should be built for 25 years last 10 15 years before it starts to become obsolete i don't know that we'll ever like that in other words philadelphia taxpayers are supporting an airport philadelphia taxpayers are guaranteeing the interest on the bonds and the repayment of the bonds necessary to build these facilities despite the fact that the vast majority of passengers who use that facility are not philadelphians but any any improvement is good, and I'm glad they're finally doing something. It's smaller than a lot of them, a lot smaller. And uh, I don't know. It's a nice airport. As, as Barb said, that there's bigger ones. We've seen bigger ones. It's really a very nice airport. I like it. Oh, it's really nice. It is. I mean, well, what can you say about an airport? I'm proud because it's only been about two and one half years since we have had any important amounts of money with which to expand the airport. And when you consider what we have done in two and a half years, we have virtually doubled the capacity of the passenger terminal. I'm delighted that Philadelphia is in fact going to be the bicentennial city and I think that the work that we've looked at around here in the last few days is evidence of our, uh, our strong-willed uh, intent to, uh, to accommodate the bicentennial. We're going to need an awful lot of cooperation uh, among many agencies. First of all, the airlines. The airlines have to be as enthusiastic about Philadelphia as a bicentennial city as we are because they're going to have to pay for the facilities that are required to accommodate these people who will be visiting. There are roughly about 18,000 passengers a day arriving in Philadelphia by air. The airlines today could bring in here about twice as many as we're bringing in now. We need the state highway department and the United States federal government to build the highways that are so indispensable to access to this airport. Otherwise, we'll build a magnificent island that you can't reach. The city is already well started on a program for rail service to the airport, which can be a very important part of the ground access solution for this region. Now the problem that uh, we're faced with is uh, to try and connect the Philadelphia airport with uh, downtown Philadelphia by a spur from the uh, Penn Central Railroad. Uh, the service that uh, Philadelphia is developing will be operated with special purpose cars uh, with carefully developed arrangements for the passengers' baggage and in a non-stop service. I wouldn't quarrel with that. Certainly if you could get out here on a rapid transit train of some sort with your baggage already checked in at some terminal in Center City, why it would make life a lot simpler. As presently scheduled, uh, it could be in service in 1972. Uh, there may be some problems that develop there, but uh, the city is, is anxious to push it and for a very good reason because the traffic that you see here today is going to get steadily worse uh, as the automobile population expands. Uh, it's going to be further aggravated and very seriously by the actual construction of uh, the Delaware Expressway and a very major interchange here right in front of the terminal building so that it's extremely important that this uh, rail link be uh, completed and in service uh, by the time the full disruption of that highway construction uh, hits. Now you have to consider also that a good many of Philadelphia International's clients don't originate from the center city. 
they might be coming from their homes uh, anywhere in the Delaware Valley region, as far south as uh, the southern part of Delaware, so that uh, certainly a single rail line from Center City is not going to take care of all of the airport's customers. In the case of uh, this airport, for instance, only about a third of its traffic uh, starts or ends in the city of Philadelphia. The other two-thirds uh, is destined uh, for other parts of the region or starts in other parts of the region. The present statistics indicate that uh, Philadelphia International uh, will be uh, pressed for capacity sometime in the mid-1980s, possibly even earlier. However, we do have definite limitations on the ultimate capacity of Philadelphia International because it's bounded by the river, it's bounded by the Tinicum uh, Marsh. And instead of letting uh, an airport grow up as so many have around America with nothing around it but a nightmare, we've got to think through the, uh, the relationship between the airport and its neighbors. Recognizing the problems that it creates for the community and meeting those problems as well. Uh, by that I mean noise and other forms of pollution. And uh, perhaps uh, the less residential and the less suburban the community that the airport is located in may work in favor of solving some of its environmental problems because they're not so difficult. One advantage here at Philadelphia that isn't enjoyed in many places, and that is you have got an airport that can be within minutes from Center City if you get good rail transportation, and even is now uh, only minutes from Center City uh, with the highway connections that you have. With the present airport access, which is entirely highway oriented, you can travel by taxi cab, you can travel by limousine, by uh, public transportation bus, or by private car, in which case the airport parking problem is, uh, becomes a very serious one, as you know. This lot that we're walking through now, uh, when I first came here, it was only hold 2,000 cars. And today it, it holds between five and 6,000 cars. It's an open market for thieves. So for that reason, I send men here in unmarked cars. Uh, I have them here in plain clothes. I have them walk around at nighttime just like you and I are doing now. And we have had great success with this. We have walkie talkies, we have binoculars, and we have made some very good arrests. Unfortunately, you can see as big as this parking lot is, it's hard to patrol it. Now, we try to keep it as well lighted as we can at nighttime so we can see what's going on. But the, another thing that handicapped us is the fact that it is open to the public, that anybody can walk in here and say, I'm looking for my car. We get a lot of people say they, they lost their parking stubs. Sometimes what they do is bring an old car in here, an old junker, and get it, get one of the parking tickets and bring out a new one and leave the old one here that they stole somewhere else. And then they'll come out with a new one and just pay the 25 or 50 cents and they're off with a car. We get flights from California which come in from near Mexico where a great percentage of our narcotics come from. We do have a problem. But we do have a very good source of information between the custom inspectors and undercover agents and information that we receive from the airlines. We've been able to make some very good narcotic pinches. We've even tried to bring in a dog in our freight area that's able to sniff marijuana. And this has had some effect. But most of our information comes from confidential uh, uh, people that we have scattered behind the airport, uh, around the airport who do give us this information, do give us the leads, and we've made some very good arrests. Mr. Tom Mansfield, please come to Plans World Airlines passenger service counter. Most of our passengers are from out of town. Uh, and this is why I constantly have to train my men to be tolerant. Flight 4 only has made it. No, you're not going to want one in there. Get out of here. Put a bit. Mr. We do have signs posted throughout the airport, but it's hard to understand these signs when you're here for the first time. 
And I know this because when I visit a strange airport, I get mixed up. So we teach our policemen to be tolerant, be patient, and do as much as you can for these out-of-towners as you possibly can, and treat them as such. We have the honor system when you pick up your luggage. We depend uh, mostly on everybody being honest and claiming their own luggage. Well, this doesn't work all the time. There are times when we do have thieves going and pick up luggage. So what we do to compensate for this, uh, we put dummy luggage up on a rack, and uh, we assign men in plain clothes to watch this, and if anybody picks it up, then we know he's a thief. And we also ask the airlines to cooperate by putting supervisors there. We ask the sky cops to make spot checks every once in a while. They never know when we're going to check for, for claim checks. And this has deterred it, and it's kept it down to a pretty good minimum. <laughs> And now, very recently, we had U.S. Marshals assigned to the airport who, who maintain uh, an instrument to detect into the hijackers. To protect the public's constitutional rights, we don't automatically arrest them, but we warn them that we will not let them on the aircraft if they refuse to be searched. The airline has a right to, to do this. Uh, they, they give you the alternative. If you say, I refuse to be searched and we see no visible weapon, then they just refuse to give him a ticket and let him go his way. If anybody should ask the question that comes into the lounge here, I'll explain to them what it is. They'll say, uh, as you're boarding, you're walking through metal detectors here, and it's for your own benefit, your own protection. But there is no set announcement. You have people not in this station, but uh, what is it, Newark, when they first originated? They actually get up and left. And you found, uh, what is it, knives? I think you knives, said, uh, guns. And plants and whatever. Even narcotics there. they dispose of. Them. Oh, yeah. I stand there at the corner as the ticket man is collecting the tickets. People walk through, he, he takes the tickets, and I watch that light up there. Well, the marshal is responsible for maintaining this instrument at all times, and he knows what to look for, and he knows what looks suspicious and what doesn't. And uh, when anybody tries to walk through this instrument with a knife or a gun or a hand grenade, a uh, blue light will go on uh, that's up on a wall, and the U.S. Marshal will spot this. And then there's other things that are classified that, that we can determine who was a suspicious person and who isn't, that we're not at liberty to talk about. But the minute he becomes suspicious of anything, he'll stop this person. Uh, in other words, I stay down at the bottom of that step. I watch for the light, and if anybody looks suspicious or I see something that uh, out of the ordinary bulging out of somebody's pocket, I, uh, I identify myself and I explain to him that I detected something on a machine, heavy metals, and I asked them if they wanted to be searched. If they're not, if they don't want to be searched, then I turn around and I tell the ticket man at the top of the stairs and I leave it to, up to him. Here. We don't know what we're preventing by having this instrument here, and everybody has to go through it. There'll be several of these uh, located throughout the airport. I worry about everybody who uses this airport. Uh, I think about it all the time. I get called about it at nighttime during the day or my days off, and I want it this way. I, I want to know everything that happens here. Any offense committed against this airport or any person, I take personally. I'm very concerned about it.